Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, you are in A102, Codex Containers and Protocols, Digital Media Formats for Online Distribution. Uh, my name is Matthew Zatmary. I work at Twitch TV. Um, we're going to be going through some, some basic history of how we got in the state we are today in terms of Codex Containers Protocols. Streaming video really comes from the modern streaming video really comes from a history of two major disciplines um, influencing it. Obviously, we have the TV broadcast industry, um, but recently, with the internet becoming the prime, a major distribution force, uh, computer science has came, come in very strong in this industry as well. And because of these two distinct backgrounds, we ended up with a lot of um, an odd state that we're in, where there's a lot of uh, vocabulary disconnects and um, just some confusion. So uh, in 45 minutes here today, going over lists of codecs and containers and how they work together and everything, it's, it's way ambitious. So instead of trying to cover all of the, the what and how of all this, I'm going to cover a few specific elements on, on why. Why some of these things are, to, are today, why some protocols or containers are more popular than others, why some things seem more difficult than they should be. Um, basically, my attempt is try to make some of this stuff a little less intimidating to people who, aren't, who don't do this day, every single day. So um, I come from a computer science background, so that's where my perspective is going to be on this. So anyone who has more of a broadcast might disagree with me on a few points here today. Um, but with computer science, when we talk about pretty much everything, it's really we divide it into layers of abstraction. So everything is built on the thing before it. So software is built on an operating system. An operating system is built on a kernel, is built on hardware. And we get higher up the stack or lower down the stack. So everything is built above it or below it. Um, so, I'm sorry. So um, in the codec container video world, the lowest layer we're going to be talking about today is the codec. So this is the title page from the H.264 specification. Um, the word codec, if for those of you who don't know, just means coder decoder. It's just kind of those two words scrunched together. Um, so the important thing to note, though, is that codecs are really standards. They're not implementations. They're not physical. They're just a document. They just say how video should, or, or audio for that matter, should be represented. They're, they're Basically, how do we take multi-dimensional data? In the case of video, we have width and height and time. In audio, we have time and signal. And how do we take that data and represent it in a way that if I give it to you, you can understand it? Um, and by documenting that, that's how we can do that. So now we can have multiple organizations work together off the same basis and be compatible. So um, Again, just for the confusion, uh, we name these things differently. So ISO has what they call it as 14496. There's MPEG-4 Part 10, AVC. These all are, mean the same thing, and they're all talking about H.264, um, specifically the H.264 implementation. So <clears throat> um, this can sometimes cause confusion. I've gotten a question a lot about, you know, are we using H.264 or are we using X.264? Well, both, <laughs> because X264 is an implementation of H264. So many different companies have different implementations, but they're all of the same standard, so this is just to make them compatible. Another thing that's described in these documents is how to take this, pa this data, and once it's encoded, how to serialize it. So Wikipedia definition here, uh, serialization in computer science is the context of data storage. Serialization is the process of translating data structures or object state into a format that can be stored, for example, in file memory buffer transmitted across the network connection link and then reconstructed later and this, uh, in the same or another computer environment. Uh, basically, what this is saying is in computers, everything is one dimensional. All memory is one dimensional. It's an ever increasing length of individual bits. We look at video frames and we see two-dimensional and we see time, but that's all represented in this one-dimensional data structure. So serialization is a way of taking that data and stretching it out over a number of bits. And then those bits can be stored in memory, transmitted over a network, or stored to a disk. So this is from the H.264 specification. This is one piece of it. It's a very small piece. 
the specification in and of itself is uh, 790 pages in the last document I have. Um, this is one of those pages. <laughs> um, this uses something, this is something called the sequence parameter set in H.264. This takes, this tells the decoder um, everything it needs to know to deco start decoding the video frames. So this has information such as the resolution, the profile level, uh, it may encode the frames per second, it has information about what, what color space we're in. Basically just everything the encoder needs to know to get going. But this specification, or this particular part of the specification, also shows how to serialize that. If you look down the columns on the right, it says, or right at the very beginning, it says profile IDC, and it says U8. That means the profile IDC value is encoded into eight bits. And then there's uh, five constraint flags, one bit each, and then it just continues. So if you take all this data, pack it in the structure, write each piece out using that number of bits, you end up with a packet at the end, and that packet, the decoder knows how to read and parse. So H.264 encodes these packets into something they call NALUs, which are network abstraction layer units. They're really just a packet of variable length. It could be, it could be a sequence parameter set, it could be a keyframe, it could be a B frame, uh, it could be supplementary enhancement info like, uh, like your subtitle, something along those lines. Um, so these NALUs now, now we end up with multidimensional again. We have multiple NALUs. So the H.264 um, specifies a way of getting this into an elementary stream. So we refer to it as an elementary stream is that final serialized version of a codec. So H.264 specifies, um, doesn't specify a specific way of doing that, but it does specify, it does give a optional way. And that's called uh, Annex B, and it's actually specified in Annex B of that document. And all this says is if you use a specific byte sequence, either three or four bytes of th two or three zeros followed by a one byte, and then use that at the start of every network abstraction layer unit, then the player can actually find every single network abstraction layer unit in the stream, and it knows how to decode it. But there's also a second form, which, there it goes, um, which is specified in a separate document, which is the ISO 1449615, um, called the AVC Decoder Configuration Record. Uh, you don't have to remember this. It's also called AVCC or MP4. It's, it's also often referred to as MP4 because this is the format the MP4 files use. Um, and what this does is this is similar, does, it has the same job as the Annex B, except this takes the, the parameter sets that the decoder needs to decode the video and kind of sets that aside of the elementary stream and leaves it up to the codec or the container to deliver that as a separate piece. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, so here's an example um, of a real elementary stream. Um, for those of you who don't know, the image is Lena. This is a standard test image that's been used for, in computers for testing um, color reproduction since about 1973. It's a very, it's been used for decades, very famous. Um, I like this, this example. Um, I use this as an example on a Stack Overflow question that I answered, and I like this a lot because um, it's a recognizable image, um, but it's once compressed using H.264, it's extremely small. This whole image is only 630 bytes on disk. Um, and this is the complete elementary stream representation over on the left. So you can see what I was talking about. I wish I had a laser pointer. But um, at the beginning, you can see your, that start code that I mentioned. You have 0001 and then followed by 67. And that 6-7, the 7 means this is a sequence parameter set. Um, at the, if you look down on the second line at the end, it's 0, 0, 0, and then it wraps to the third line, 1. That's our next start code. Uh, 6 eight, 8 is a part called a picture parameter set. It's part of that extra data. Uh, and then a little bit further in the line, you see 0, 0, 1. There's, that's a 3-byte start code followed by 6-5. Five. 5 is the keyframe. So the rest of that data is the actual visual uh, video coding layer data it's as it's referred to in the specification. If we had an additional frame right there at the bottom, we could just add another start code and then have a 6-1, one, one being a B frame or a P frame, and just continue the stream indefinitely. Um, sorry, I moved forward too, too, for, forward too fast there. So anyway, this, this shows how to encode video into an elementary stream, but we still have multi-dimensional multi data because we want to add audio. So when we add audio, we now have two infinitely long single-dimensional pieces of information that we need to 
get down to a second uh, one-dimensional or new one-dimensional layer. And this is referred to as multiplexing. So another Wikipedia de definition here, um, in telecommunications and computer networks, multiplexing, sometimes contracted to muxing, is a method by which multiple analog message signals or digital data streams are combined into one signal and shared over, over, sent over a shared me medium. So this is really just more serialization. Um, and this is where we get to the separation of the protocols and containers and codecs. So a lot of people might look at an MP4 file and say, oh, this is an MPEG-4 file and assume, make assumptions about, about the codec inside. Uh, that's just the container. The container does the multiplexing. It also serves several other purposes. It encodes timestamps to make sure those streams are aligned so you continue lip sync. Um, and it'll oftentimes, in the case of like protocols, have um, information about you know, retransmission and, and everything along those lines. Um, but since they actually serve the same purpose, containers and protocols, they actually, the lines tend to get blurred a little bit. Um, you end up with things like transport streams, which kind of fall into both camps. <clears throat> um, as a rule of thumb, I tend to think of protocols as an on-wire representation and containers as an on-disk representation. Uh, protocols often have some sort of intelligent server component, whereas a container might make assumptions about the medium it's stored on, like access times on a hard disk or, um, or on a CD-ROM or something along, along those lines. But like I said, it's, they, they can, uh, they, they'll have properties of both sometimes. So I'm going to take a, now that we've covered that, take a quick detour here, and we mentioned muxing. Um, and some of you may have heard the word muxing um, before, or I'm sure many of you have. But I, another question I get a lot of is, what's the difference between a transcode and a transmux? So um, you can use FFmpeg as an example here, and it's very small on my screen, I apologize. So in this example, we're taking a MP4 and just converting it to an FLV. So if we di dissect this instruction here, we're saying, F hey, FFmpeg, take um, dash i input file mp4. So now it knows this is an mp4 container and it knows th how those elementary streams are muxed inside of that mp4 container. We're now saying, I want you to take the video codec libx264 and set that up because I'm gonna encode with it. Take the audio codec libfdk aac, set that up so we can deco decode with it or encode with it. Um, I then want you to read the MP4 processing every frame by decoding it, sending it to the, the correct encoder, and then at the end, I want you to send the output of those two encoders to the FLV muxer, and then finally out to the FLV file on disk. So there's a lot of things going on in this simple command. But um, as you know, encoding and decoding video, it takes a lot of CPU. So sometimes you'll have an MP4 file that you want in an FLV file, but it's already in H.264 and AAC. You just want to switch containers. That's called a transmux. So FFmpeg uses a special codec type called copy. And this, co this codec type basically says, don't decode, don't encode. Just take the elementary stream out of the MP4s, split them into the two elementary streams, the audio stream and the video stream, and send those two streams down to the FLV the muxer and write that out to disk. And this is extremely fast because muxing and demuxing is a pretty light operation. Generally, on a command like this, your bottleneck is gonna be the throughput of your network or hard drive. So it's a much, much more efficient way of processing the streams. So to di dive into a little more specific examples here, um, RTMP, uh, RTM is what I'm gonna use for a, a protocol example. RTMP is very successful, mostly due to the su su success of Flash on the internet. Um, RTMP made it very easy for a very long time to get video on the, on the internet, which as we all know is a very hard problem. Um, RTMP though is, the name itself is a little interesting because it re means real-time messaging protocol. It's not media protocol or video protocol, it's messaging. So this basically is just a method, uh, a document from Adobe. It's not backed by any standards bodies that I'm aware of. Um, but it's just a method that Adobe said, well, you can take, using this protocol, you can take multiple messages and send them from a client to a server. And those messages really could be anything. Um, they're generally referred to as tags, in addition to messages. 
and RTMP takes these tags, multiplexes them, and pushes them over TCP. The multiplexing in RTMP is pretty straightforward. It just takes each tag and it breaks it down into fixed size chunks, and then we'll send you know, a little from you know, the audio frame, a little from the video frame, and try to get those two frames at the destination around the same time. Um, even though there are, it is generic messaging protocol, there are some standard tag types for audio, video, and script. Script is just their name for metadata. Uh, it's part of the flash scripting um, background, which is why they call it, refer to it as script. Um, and then if on receive end, you take these tags and you save them out to disk in timestamp order, that is actually exactly the format of an FLV file. So RTMP is a protocol for sending FLV, essentially. Um, so we're going to look at the actual format of an FLV tag here. So uh, this is, you can read this docu or this, this diagram by um, each row is a byte and each column would be a bit in that byte. So if we look at the first byte, you can see bits three through seven store um, what type of tag this is. This is a video tag, an audio tag, or a script tag. Um, there's a data size to say how, how big this tag is gonna be. There's the timestamp. I mentioned that these, they have to be aligned. You have to be able to play them back in order at the other end at ex exact moments, otherwise you could lose sync. That's, uh, handled through this timestamp. Uh, stream ID is actually not used in the format, even though it's there. Then there's optional headers for sound. So if, it, if tag type equals eight, you, you'll, it'll send the stuff in the blue. That'll say, what codec is this? So um, in this case, MP3 is two, AAC is 10. I think there's, there's quite a few audio codecs in there. I didn't want to list them all here. But then it also says, what's the, bit, the sound rate? The, that would be sample rate, channels, things like that. Video, same thing. We have a special video header type. Um, in this case, if it's video, there's a frame type, uh, which would be iframe, p frame. And there's, the co again, codec, just like an audio. So there's about 16 different codecs in our TMP. Um, on to VP6 is number four. Number seven is AVC. Those, I chose to list those two because they're by far the most common used in our TMP and, and FLV. Um, AVC, H which of course is H264, is common for obvious reasons. Um, the onto VP6 is quite common because that's what the Flash player itself is able to produce. So if you use Flash to you know, video conference or stream right out of your browser, it's probably using VP6. Um, if it does use H.264, there's an additional header part, and there's this extra byte down there called a, that I have labeled AVC header in green. And this is a byte that says, is this a sequence header or a now you? Um, I want to point out here, this, this is odd, because this is a case where Adobe chose to label things very strangely. Um, sequence header, this, is, this goes back to what I was saying about the different elementary stream formats of H.264. This is using that MP4 style, the AVCC style format. And in this case, that packet type, if it was set to zero, would have that extra data, that data re that the decoder needs to initialize itself. Um, I'm not sure why they called that. I, they called it sequence header because it's pic, uh, sequence parameter set, but technically there's also picture parameter sets in here, so I'm not sure why they chose that name. Also, AVC NALU, this is very deceptive too because that's, this really should be called an access unit. In H.264, an access unit is a frame, and an access unit can be con contain multiple NALUs, multiple network abstraction layer units. So they should have called this an AU. Um, I'm pointing this out because, as I was saying, the, a lot of the confusion in video comes around vocabulary and misuse of vocabulary. And this is in a, an official document from Adobe um, misusing the word. So it, it, it gets extremely complicated through some of these things. Um, then, of course, you have the body, which would be the actual payload, would be the extra data or audio data or video data. And then it repeats the size of the tag again. Um, this is theoretically so you can walk through a file backwards. I've never actually seen that done, but that's what it's for. Um, so I'm going to re revisit the transcode transmux with using what we just talked about. So here's another transcode example. We're going to take an FLV and go out to a TS file this time. Maybe we're going to um, segment this for HLS a little bit later on. Um, so here's our transcode, and of course, success. It runs no problem. But this file, lucky enough, is AVC H264 uh, AAC, so we're going to try to transmux it. So we run the command and we get an error. Well, great. <laughs> so what's the problem here? Well, 
in this case, you can actually see where it says MPEG TS. So this means this is from the MPEG TS muxer, the bit of code in FFmpeg that's actually doing the muxing. It's saying, I can't find a start code. I, I want a start code. Because uh, transport streams use the former um, Annex B style format. So it's giving you an error. It's saying, I don't know what this data is. It's probably MP4 style data. Um, try using this bitstream command. So it's being helpful and telling you what you might be able to do to solve the problem. Um, it turns out in this case it's right, but this is the reason why sometimes when you're doing a command like this, you have to add this extra information that you know, it seems like you shouldn't need to. It's, it, it worked before. It worked when I went from MP4 to FLV, but now it's not working. What changed? And that's exactly what changed is that, that particular bit of elementary stream format. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about CDNs while we're off on a bit of a tangent. Um, so CDNs historically have provided really good options for streaming servers, for RTMP, for RTP, you know, all the protocols such as that. Um, but they had some disadvantages over like uh, HTTP as its counterpart. Uh, part of those advantages are like the software itself is particularly complex. A lot of the software it has to track users individually, so now every user has to be tracked on the server, so now the server requires more RAM, more CPU resources. Uh, that software is generally not free, so you have to pay licensing. Uh, it's, and just in general, it makes delivery of these formats way more complicated. HTTP has some really interesting properties that would be great if we could take advantage of um, over these streaming services. So one is, like I said, cheaper hardware because we don't, we don't need the, the all, the HTTP is stateless. Once a piece of data is delivered, the server can forget about it. It can forget who, who, who asked for it. It can forget all that data. It doesn't need to track anything. This, the software is cheap, like as in free, the, uh, Ado uh, Adobe. Apache, Nginx, Varnish, very, very good HTTP architecture systems, and they're free and open source. Uh, there's also cache efficiency uh, with HTTP. If I request a file from halfway around the world, then you know, it'll take time for me to get it. If I request that file a second time, the edge kept a copy for me, so I don't have to go all the way around the world again. With a uh, protocol, some sort of streaming server, there's additional information because you go to the edge and the edge says, I don't know who you are if, you're, if you want HTTP. So it has to send you all the way back to the origin again. C uh, HTTP will just say, oh, I have a copy already. You don't have to go back there. And then, of course, lastly, is just economies of scale. The rest of the internet works on HTTP. It, because, because of that, you could just get these economies of scale. They're, they're building these, C, these massive CDNs out to deliver your web pages and your images. And because of that, if we, if we can backbone, uh, uh, jump on that, the bandwagon of that, then we get all that advantages. We get, all, we get the cheaper delivery of the exact same video. Um, so that's where progressive download came in. That, the idea was, hey, what if we just take our FLV file and we'll throw it up on an HTTP server and start playing it? Well, that sort of worked. Basically what happens is the file starts downloading and instead of downloading to your downloads folder, it stores it into a little temporary folder that somewhere deep on your hard drive that you might not, can't see, and then just starts playing that file off of the hard drive. And it works, and it works okay. Uh, the problem, of course, is you can't play something that hasn't been downloaded yet. You have to wait. And if you want to jump forward, you have to wait until all the things you don't want to watch is downloaded. Um, there is a part of the HTTP 1.1 standard that um, became popular around 1996. It was actually out prior to that, but there wasn't a lot of support. That does let you say, I want to request um, a file starting at a certain offset, but that offset is in bytes. So you still need to know at what byte you want to start at. And I showed you the FLV format, and if we just jumped into the middle of a tag, it would look like gibberish. You know, we have to, because we, we have to start with, we don't know what uh, frame type it is, tag type it is. We don't know the timestamps. We don't know how to line ourselves in that stream either. So we have to download one tag to know how big the next tag is, to know how big the next tag is. So we can't use the, H the HTTP 1.1 byte, byte ranges to jump around in the file. Um, so people thought of that. And that's why MP4 became popular. Because MP4 is, is an on-disk container. Uh, it really had no uh, history of streaming. There's a minor uh, exception to that in the case of hint tracks. 
but this was really designed as an on-disc format for video. So being on disc, they thought, well, you're going to want to jump around all the time. So they created mechanisms for that built right into the file. Um, MP4 format, also 14.496.12. Its history actually comes from um, Apple, who invented the MOV QuickTime file format back in 93, and this was extended from that. Um, so the spec goes all the way back to um, the QTFF. So MP4 is interesting. Um, so MP4 is broken down to individual pieces. Those pieces are called um, either atoms or boxes. Apple originally called these little chunks atoms, and then ISO renamed them to boxes for some reason. They're, they're hierarchical uh, in nature, so you can have boxes within boxes within boxes, and this is how data can get organized. And of course, as part of that specification is how to take those boxes and serialize them. Um, but there's two important ones that we're going to talk about. First is the MOV, which is mo movie. It's a weird abbreviation, but that's what it stands for. Uh, this contains all the information about the file. This contains all the frame information, what the duration of the frames, the timestamps of the frames, how big they are, what their type is. It also contains that extra data in that MP4 format. Uh, <clears throat> so it contains everything you need to know to read the rest of the file. So then the rest of the file is stored in just MDAT. It's just data. And this is just raw data. It's without that MOV, it's intelligible, it's literally random, you don't know what's audio, what's video, it's just a dumping ground for data, and the MOV makes reference to that data and tells you how to parse and read that. So when you generate an MP4 file, you need to generate that MOV piece, of course. Now the problem with that is you can't generate that and serialize that until you know everything there is to know about the file. You need to know about every frame, the size of every frame, the duration of every frame, which means you can't possibly make the MOV box until the file's done, which has two problems. One, live is out the window, because live has an infinite duration, so we can't use this for live. Um, and then number two is when we do that, at the end of the file, we say, okay, stop encoding. So it takes all the index data it's been collecting, uh, writes it to this MOV, and then sticks it on the end of the file. Well, now we're even worse than we were in FLV, because now we have to download the whole file in order to get to the end, in order to jump back and play the stuff we already downloaded. Um, so the solution to that is something called fast start. So FFmpeg comes with this tool called Fast Start, and all it does is rewrites that file. It takes that bit at the end and writes it back to the beginning. We couldn't, we couldn't possibly know it before, so that's why this has to be a two-step process. You have to encode and then Fast Start. Um, so of course that works. FFmpeg also has a switch, just where you can say move flags Fast Start. I actually think there's a more modern version of the switch. I didn't look it up, though. Um, which this basically says, you know, just like before, create the file and then run fast start, but just do it as one step. This, but this still does the same thing. It runs two passes on the file. And of course, that works. So that brings us to a little more modern formats, which are fragmented streaming. So we have solutions for everything, but it's across a million different containers and protocols. So fragmented streaming is the latest uh, approach to all this. So. Um, Fragmented streaming was actually pioneered by a company called Move Networks. So it became popular around 1996. Uh, they had limited success. I believe they're owned by DirecTV now. Um, and their, their technique basically took the video and broke it down into little fragments. Um, this technique, though, was, became very popular, even though the company itself wasn't so much. Um, it was duplicated by Adobe in the form of HDS, Microsoft at Smooth Streaming, and HLS at Apple. Um, I, I worked for Move Networks, and we had conversations with all these companies. And um, 18 months later, they started launching products. So um, it was, but it was a great, a great idea, and it, it's great that it was able, able to run with it. So basically, as I said before, it takes this video and breaks it down to little, little chunks. So it solves the, the MP4 problem um, by by literally making two to 10 to 20, whatever you set, second MP4 files. In the case of HDS and smooth streaming, it literally is an extension on top of the MP4 specification. So you still have your MOV box, uh, but it doesn't have the sample data in it. It doesn't have the frame data. This is called your initialization segment. So if you've done much with uh, MSE or, or Dash, you have that initialization segment. That's where this comes from. That's the history of that. That's your MOV box. 
But again, it doesn't contain the sample data. So where do we put the sample data now? Um, basically, we, they took the sample data and invented a new box type called MOF, which stands for movie fragment. And that contains all the sample data now for that two second or 10 second segment. That 10 second segment is stored into an MDAT, just like before, an MP4. And then those are, um, can be concatenated into a single file for what's called the on-disk format or, our, or streamed individually, sometimes with an M4S extension for the on-wire format. So um, that, as I mentioned before, that enabled live streaming over HTTP. Um, it also gave us the benefit of having smart clients now. So we were able to, now we have dumb servers. Well, if we want to put intelligence in, we can start putting intelligence into the client. So we basically, from this process, got the adaptive streaming for free. The client can now choose which bit rate it wants to, wants to handle. And we, now it just takes the client code to do that, and we can still use all the dumb servers, extremely fast, extremely cheap um, servers that we've been building out for decades now. And then um, where we're at today in all this is basically media source extensions. I wanted to bring this up specifically because media source extensions is an extension part of the browser spec where you can actually take these, these MOF, MO, MDAT formats called fragments and give them right to the browser and it can play them. So we're finally getting out of the plugin system. You, we're, we're eliminating Flash. Um, even even non-Flash video usually loaded some sort of a plugin that was written by the operating system vendor. This is now down at the low level layers of the, of the browser. This is, this is giving us a, a, lot of, a lot of places to go with it. And it's abstracting away the high-end stuff, the, the, the manifest formats, everything like that. Now we're free to choose what we want to do along those lines. So for example, you know, Dash has its manifest format that it's promoting, uh, but you could use an alternate manifest format. Dash, of course, is more or less the Microsoft Smooth Streaming binary format with just an XML manifest. I know the Dash people out there are getting really mad at me right now because it's so much more than that. Um, but that's what it is. Um, <laughs> H HDS is similar. That would use um, an MP4 format. Um, I don't think it's media source extensions compatible. Both Smooth Streaming and Dash should be compatible with media source extensions. Apple, of course, uses the Transport Stream, which works with media source extensions technically in the spec. It says it's supposed to. The only browser that's implemented that is Safari on Mac, though. So the spec says yes. Um, reality says no. So we're basically going to be the, that, the MDAT, the fragmented MP4 streaming with v media source extensions is just, that's the future, that's where everything will go. Um, it's barely even the future now, it's pretty much the present. So I was at NAB this year at the Dash IF forum, they said Hulu was sending 80% of its content over Dash now. Uh, and really the only reason why it's prob probably the only reason why it's not 100% is iOS. iOS were still stuck with HLS with this uh, transport stream format. Hopefully with iOS 8 coming out, they'll adopt it. If Apple's out there, please. Um, and I, that's pretty much it for me today. So I have my email here, someone wants to contact me, or we have a, a couple of minutes for questions, if there's any questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't know what iOS is percent of Hulu, but I know they were. I was wondering, I mean, in general, don't you think Apple is going to just force people to use HLS forever? Uh, no. So Apple's already shown, shown um, there's already been cracks in that. Um, Safari on Yosemite supports fragmented MP4 streaming. So um, the. You know, nobody knows why Apple does anything Apple does. Um, it was probably pressure from Netflix to get off Silverlight. Um, even from what I understand, even Microsoft wanted off of Silverlight. And um, Silverlight was a great way. Silverlight was, had amazing cross-platform DRM. And until, I didn't, men I, I didn't mention it, but there's a, an encrypted standard on top of the media source extensions um, called uh, Common Encryption or EME. And that EME is basically gives you a common way of protecting the data. And then a third party, can, you can do your key exchange and through a third party. So um, that enabled Netflix to, to move off of Silverlight 
And probably, no one knows anything for sure, of course, but probably the only reason why they were still on Silverlight was Mac, because they could get, they could get studio approved DRM on Mac. Um, but yeah, so there's already been showing that, that Apple is at least starting to adopt some of that. Whether they're going to continue that to iOS or not, I hope so, but we'll see. Yes? Yes. Are, are you doing Dash already, or is that, is that the future? So, um, yeah, we're, we're still 100% HLS, and um, because of our architecture, but because, because we are mostly live content um, by, I don't know what the exact number is, but mostly live, and because we have so many streams that we have to process, you know, tens of thousands concurrently, um, also, we run our own CDN backbones, and because of that, we only have two choices. We either have to retransmit the data twice over the backbone, which means our backbone capacity is cut in half if we devel devel deliver multiple formats, or we have to transmux at the edge, which means our edges need more CPU, more RAM, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so far, we've just been able to get all the players to support HLS. Uh, it's tricky to do that sometimes with some of the um, players really wanting to push Dash. Um, whether we'll get there someday, um, I really hope so, but it's really going to be a either, you yeah, know, we'll have to figure out something when the time comes. So far it hasn't been a limiting factor for us, and um, since iOS is a, a market we're very interested in, uh, we're not just gonna leave that behind, obviously. So that's, that's why we're still strictly iOS, or I'm sorry, HLS. Any other questions? Yes. All right, so you mentioned your use case is live, mm -hmm. um, primarily live. Um, what is that? What is live mean to you? It's similar to my use case. It's live, but I need, I need 700 milliseconds. Um, yeah, so um, our current latency is probably in the 10 to um, at the probably absolute best to maybe 30 at the probably actually better, probably 20, 25 at the worst, assuming you're not buffering. If you hit buffering events, you might fall a little further behind. Um, that's what we treat. It's, it's, we're trying to improve on that. It's very difficult in HTTP streaming. That's one of the downsides. Um, RTMP, RTP, these are still gonna be much more lower latency. But again, as we're saying, the benefits of switching, um, our biggest problem was actually scale. We, with, you know, the 100 million viewers we have, we, we just couldn't scale RTMP any further. Why is this UDP? Well, we'd have to have, well, we UDP, I love UDP, but you can only use something that the players can play, right? So we'd have to go out and develop all the players that can support that custom stream, right? Uh, well, on iOS, we use the iOS, but yeah, we, we develop, but in browser, for example. So, you know, in Flash, you can, you can open an HTTP request or a TCP socket, but I don't think you can open a UDP socket in Flash. There's also cross-platform. You know, we're on, um, you know, Fire TV, we're on, you know, PlayStation, Xbox, there's the, ooh, well, the game console, we're on uh, the, the Vita, Nintendo, uh, Sony Vita handheld, we're on. So, um, yeah, we'd have to develop that for, for all of those platforms. Although, it's, um, it's interesting you brought that up. We were just discussing before we came in here about HTTP 2.0, and Google has some experiments using a protocol called QUIC, which is HTTP 2.0 over UDP, and I'm really hoping they make some progress on that, uh, because that would basically put UDP into the browser, and um, we'd be able to take advantage of a lot of that at that point. Yes? Um, well, the, the joke I always say, there's only two problems with H.265, and that's encoding it and playing it back. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> encoding it, we, we do all our content live. So we have 10,000 plus streamers, you know, concurrent. Um, the top 1% of those might own an elemental or something that's capable of doing it in real time. But you need, what, minimum fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in hardware to encode H.265 in real time now. And then on the playback side, 
Um, it's not there on iOS yet. The iOS 6 actually has a decoder on board, but Apple doesn't let developers use it. Um, they're keeping it to themselves for FaceTime right now. Adoption in web browsers is zero, none whatsoever. Um, Adobe shows no interest in adopting it for the browser. Um, again, we're, we're years out on H.265, years out. We, we need to get it into the, the, the hands for playback, and it's just, it's just not there yet. That plus hardware upgrade cycle, so even if uh, starting tomorrow all iOS and Android devices supported H.265 playback, it'll be two years before for the upgrade cycle to get it into everyone's hands. Uh, VP9, um, VP9, same thing for VP9 with one additional um, restriction is um, hardware playback. So H.264, H.265 being you know, open backed standards, not that VP9 is and it's open source, so it's open. But there's a lot of industry, there's a lot of bodies, there's a lot of uh, organizations promoting this format to chip manufacturers. So if VP9, if Google could convince uh, companies to include hardware encoders and decoders into their chip designs, we'll see, much more likely see adoption that way. But so far, um, Google actually, no, I, I, they shut that down, sorry. No, but yeah, the, basically they need, it, it's, it's just hardware support at this point. And you don't want to do it in software because then your phone gets hot in your hand and your battery goes dead in 30 minutes. Yes? Well, there, there will definitely be, there's definitely a market for it. So a great market would be, you know, Netflix. Um, you know, Netflix has, you know, Netflix has way more playback than us, but is, in terms of video coming in, we dwarf it, right? So Netflix can afford to take a movie and spend three, four, five days, they don't, but they could if they wanted to, encoding it, right? S getting it as small as possible, spending every last, bit of resource, because once that's on the server, it'll be watched a million, two million times. So if you can save 1%, that's big, big money over the, over the long run. Same thing with multiple formats. They can do an H.264 version, an H.265 version, and if only 10% of the people can play the H.265 version, yes, let's do it, because we'll save, we'll save bits, we'll save money that way. Um, for a case like us, where our per channel viewership is lower, uh, we'd say, it w and the, the cost of encoding is so much higher that the economics just don't make sense. So um, is it inevitable? It's, it's, it's here today in extremely, limited, in extremely limited ways. It will grow, you know, will it grow, will it double next year its usage? Will it triple, will it go 10%? I'm not sure. Will it ever be just the standard like H.264 is? Um, I don't know, not unless they can speed up encoding drastically because encoders still, Either that or we'll need hardware encoders. We'll just need to start being built into CPUs from day one. Um, again, now we're in a hardware cycle and you know, PCs upgrade less frequently than phones, probably three or four years. So it's, uh, and even then, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I hope that answered your question, yes. Um, well, if you're doing anything today, and you can, I highly recommend media source extensions because you can just do everything in JavaScript. You don't need any Flash, anything. Um, for, in, for encode? Oh, well, encode streamers. for streamers. Oh, well, for us, there's, they, you, for our use case, our streamers use some dedicated tools. There's one called XSplit and one called OBS. Um, but we, take, we still take in RTMP, and we still distribute HLS. But anything that R, that'll deliver RTMP will work for us. Um, but there's, you know, we could just switch protocols or uh, you know, something, you know, that, that works you know, uh, without the flashback backing, so. Any other questions? WebRTC? Yeah, so um, I didn't bring up WebRTC mostly because um, I don't know enough about it and I'd probably make a fool of myself. It's very interesting to me. It's based on RTP, I believe. 
Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, it could be interesting. I haven't seen, I've, I, I've seen some demos delivering video with WebRTC. Um, I haven't explored that myself yet, so I can't comment too much because I just don't know. But it, it, there's, there could be some potential there. But again, it's a protocol, so now we have to have a server or it's not HTTP, so CDNs are a problem. And, um, but limited use cases, could, it could make a big impact. Okay, is that all? Great, thank you very much.